In 1760, most of Virginia was a vast and unexplored colony of England, but its capital, Williamsburg, was far from being a wilderness. It was a proper English town filled with proper English people who followed closely the news and fashions of the mother country. The upper class had servants to take care of their needs. The house servants were usually well-dressed. Ladies slept in a chemise. They often had fabric slippers and a cape-like garment called a night rail to ward off the chill when they arose. Although male servants were clothed much in the same fashion as their masters, the female servants wore simple dresses with neckerchiefs, aprons, and caps. If the lady's night chemise were not actually dirty, she might well have continued to wear it as a shift during the day. In that case, the first garment she would put on would be the under or chemise petticoat. Underdrawers were not customarily worn by English ladies in this period. Stockings, which were donned next, were knitted of cotton, wool, or silk. My fingers are cold. Can you help with this one? Shoes, made locally or imported from England, were handmade of colored leathers or patterned fabrics. They were not normally custom fashioned for right or left feet as shoes are today. Is breakfast started? Yes, ma'am. All choice done except feeding the chickens. By the mid 18th century, stay making was a highly developed and important craft, practiced almost exclusively by men. Stays were made of cloth and stiffened with whalebone, cane, or horn strips. These were worn, often from infancy, to achieve the proper shape and silhouette demanded by fashion. I think I'll wear the gray silk today, Cornelia. Yes, ma'am. The blue petticoat? Yes. Women in the 18th century allowed their hair to grow long, but seldom wore it loose. At night it would be braided, and by day put up on the head with a little cap of some sort usually worn to cover it. Good morning, Aunt Betty. Good morning, dear. Good morning, Miss Patty. You look so pretty in this dress last night. Thank you, dear. We had a most enjoyable time, and the supper was elegant indeed. I'm afraid we danced until far too late, though. You see how tardy we are in getting up this morning? Good morning, Benjamin. Have you dressed yourself this morning? 
Very small children of both sexes wore dresses. As they grew older, they wore modified versions of adult fashions. Don't waken your uncle. He's tired this morning. Maybe you'd like to go outside. How would you like to feed the chickens? Make sure he's dressed warm enough before he goes outside. Clothes were not stored in closets. Normally, they were kept in chests or wardrobes. Ladies' gowns were not fashioned with pockets. Useful and often decorative accessory pockets tied about the waist. These were accessible through pocket openings provided in the gown and petticoat. Another distinctive item of feminine attire was the hoop device, or side panniers worn to achieve the contoured shape considered most fashionable. The gown, or outer garment, consisted of three parts. The gown itself, a gown petticoat, and a stomacher. The gown petticoat was often made of the same material as the gown, though it might also have been of a different material or a contrasting color. Do you want the blue stomacher? Mm, no, the matching one, Cornelia. Elaborately quilted petticoats were decorative and worn for added warmth in winter. A sheer or decorative apron was often worn as an accessory to the gown. Can I wear an apron this morning? No, I don't think I want it. A great variety of clothing fabrics, wools, cottons, linens, and silks, were available to the American colonists. Printed chintzes, plain and fancy woolens, and worsted were popular. An astounding variety of plain or brocaded dress silks could be had in a wide price range. The insert at the front of the bodice of the gown was called a stomacher. This piece was often decorated with needlework or with rows of ribbon bows called as shells. Pinned or hooked into place, its primary function was to conceal the necessary lacing or other means of fitting the bodice to the figure. Other gowns fashionable in this period closed edge to edge in the center front and did not require a stomacher. Remember to fold the gown carefully when you put it away, Cornelia. <laughs> you are feeling good this morning. Good morning, sir. I got your hot water. Oh. Hot water. master these days everywhere but in his own house can't sleep with all that jibberty jabber 
when it finally does get quiet, you have to get up because the water's hot. Would you like me to save you, sir? Hmm? Yes, as long as the water's hot. Most upper-class men kept their hair short or had a shaved head to accommodate their wigs. When not wearing a wig, the head was covered with a cap. Shaving brushes looked like those available today. A shaving basin caught the drippings. What clothes are you wearing today? Hmm. Who am I seeing this morning? Have the green bridges been cleaned? Yes, sir. Oh, well. Hmm. Oh, yes. <clears throat> A banyan, or nightgown, was more than just an 18th century robe. As a wrap over other clothes, it was considered fashionable negligee or casual dress. One might receive one's friends in it or even wear it on the street. Some gentlemen wore drawers. The knee breeches, universally worn at this time, were normally lined with linen or other washable material. Shirts were made of linen or cambric and pulled over the head. Depending on the occasion, they could be plain or made fancy with ruffles or lace trim. A separate piece, the neckcloth or collar, buttoned or buckled at the back. Alternately, a stock, such as the servant is wearing, could be wrapped around the neck and folded over in front, with the ends tucked into a waistcoat. Stockings were knitted of cotton, wool, or silk, and could be purchased in almost any color. Fancy ones were patterned or had knitted designs or embroidered decorations at the ankles. Such decorations were known as clocks. The buttons or buckles at the knee band of the breeches were sufficiently tight to hold the stockings in place. Shoe horns are so called because originally they were made from animal horns.
pockets in the breeches and coat provided room for coins, watches, handkerchiefs and the like. Gentlemen also carried wallet-like cases of leather or needlework in which letters and such were kept. Waistcoats cut along the same line as the coat were plain or very fancy. Brocaded and embroidered ones often added a note of elegance to quite plain suits. Hairstyles varied widely in the 18th century, but most gentlemen wore a wig. Approaching the revolution, the stylish wig had two curls at each side and a club or a bag in the back. The coat was collarless and close-fitting. An air of elegance was added by decorative buttons and buttonholes on front, cuffs, and pocket flaps. Put my hat and cloak in the hall, Robert. Thank you.